different words. So after we finish last uh, last week lesson, uh, right afternoon that day, m uh, Tuesday t Tuesday afternoon, I have sent you the reference answers for quiz number one, right? So I will do the same for quiz number two. And uh, why do we need to take the test? Well, basically, first, this course is rather intensive because it, uh, it serves a very important keystone for you to get started for your business, academic business in inter international affairs. So indeed, you really need to study hard uh, to, uh, to catch up a lot. That's a requirement for you. And uh, last time we talked about the virus, right? Tipping point. I hope that you, uh, other than the anti-crime virus or the hush puppy virus, you could also be infected with the, uh, it's cool to study hard virus, okay? So let's try a little bit harder uh, because uh, as a college student, study is something you need to do, definitely, right? Other than pray, of course. If you can study and uh, you also you can pray, that would be wonderful. Don't just pray and don't study, that would be very strange. Okay, when I was in college, I studied and prayed, and, get, and I got a lot of this different discipline training too. So this is life, okay? So now, uh, let's uh, move to our top of questions here. So this is the another 40 questions for you to do. So anyone here have, has any uh, questions about the uh, the, the test, the, the practice test that you, you have no idea about the answers. So now you can just type in your, the number here. So if you have questions, just type. Okay, we have some students here. Uh, yes, okay, I will start. So let's just hold here because I'm not afraid. I'm afraid that we may not have enough time to cover all. So, so far, okay, stop, stop, stop. Stop. Okay, great. So let's do. <laughs> so let's do 18 first. Okay, it's up to you. Number 18. Let's scroll down a bit. So let's see this one. It's very important for us to uh, to notice. Uh, when we try to understand to, uh, to solve the grammatical issue or problem of a sentence, it's very important to identify the core components of the structure, of the sentence structure. For example, number, number 18, some animal activities. So this is activity, this is subject, okay? And uh, such as mating, mating is a noun. Migration is another noun, but hibernate is not a noun. So we have to change hibernation. Is that right? So look here. Noun, noun, and the noun have a yearly circle, a yearly cycle. So basically, the core components for this one is activities have cycle. That's it. So this one is subject, and this is verb, and this is the transitive, uh, this is the object. Okay, so be careful. We have to make sure that this one, hibernation, is not hibernate. Hibernate is, is, uh, is a verb, okay? Okay, so let's move to, so this is 18, and number five, move up a bit, to number five. Okay, so let's see this one. It's not clear to researchers, right? So is, is a fee verb, and clear is a subject complement. Subject complement we call 主词不语. So basically what we need here is a subject. So a subject must be a noun. A noun can take a form as a word, a phrase, or a clause. Is that right? So let's see the answer choice here, A, B, C, D. Which one can serve as a noun? 
So let's look here, and this one should be why dinosaurs became extinct. So this is a non close. Why dinosaurs became extinct is not clear to researchers. And the other is the not a non close. For example, this one why dinosaurs? And we have to have a verb here, right? But this is not a verb, it's a past, it's an adjective. So dinosaur having become, ah, uh, yeah, okay. Oh, okay, B is right, no, there, there's nothing wrong for this one. So basically we need to have a noun here, okay? And uh, let's see number 17. Okay, let's see this one. Perhaps the most popular film in movie history, Star Wars, was written and, uh, look here, written is a past perfect, it's an adjective, right? Passive tense. And this must be uh, directed, uh, directed by George Lucas. So perhaps the most popular film in movie history, so here is the subject, Star Wars, was written and directed by George Lucas, okay? And uh, let's move to 21. Okay, so all of this one, I want to ask you, uh, for you to uh, uh, serve as a roll call for here. Okay, could you tell me what is the subject for question 21? And this is a roll call. And the roll call ends in 10 seconds. Okay, so I will go into end now. Okay, so indeed, this one, most of the students here already know how to identify the subject. So first the city, city is not first city, only city. The word city is the subject. And first is a modifier to modify city, right? So in the United States, that put into effect major plans. Remember, we cannot have only one plan. That should be a not, that, that should be a lot of plans up there. So when we put into effect major plans, not one plan. If you really want to, want to use major plan, then you have to put, to put a major plan before that, okay? But the only choice we can have is plan, so we have to put a S, okay? So the first city in the United States that put into effect major plans for the clustering Clustering is a noun, there should be no problem. Gov government buildings, there are a lot of government buildings, right? There should be no, no problem. Was, so city is the subject. And uh, let's see this one. In the United States, used to modify city, okay? And uh, that used to modify city. This is the adjective clause that put into effect major plans for the clustering of government building used to modify city. So basically this is the B verb, was Washington. 
So city was Washington. It's something we need to have. Okay. So let's uh, go back here to continue to the next one. So 17, 20, and uh, we go up to 13. <coughs> so basically, sub operas are so called. So this is the complete structure. Operas are called. And because it's a subordinated conjunction, then we have to follow it. In this case, we have to follow it with the close. So look here. At first, they were. Then they is the subject for the subordinated close, right? They were. So what, which one can be the subject complement for they? When we say subject complement for be verb can have three different forms. One, it can be a noun, adjective, or a adverb for place or, or uh, a place or time. So let's look here, which one can become the subject complement for they? Must be a noun, right? This one. It's right. They were often sponsored by soap manufacturers. Okay, so this one is good. Okay, so let's uh, continue to number six. Number six, move up a bit. Six, six. Okay, let's see this one. Although many people use the word milk to refer to cow's milk, so although is a, again, is a subordinative conjunction. So this is a subordinative conjunction, subordinative clause. It is not the main clause. It is dependent clause. So basically, we need to have a clause after the comma, right? So let's see this one. To milk from any, m any mammal, including human milk and goat milk, do we see the subject? Do we see the verb? No, right? So basically, we need to find out, we need to find out these uh, components have include a subject and the verb. So basically, which one can be used to, to put it into the blank? This one is the only choice, right? It also applies to milk from any mammal, including human milk and the goat's milk. Is that right? So that would be very easy. So this is it applies. And applies is an intransitive verb, so it has to be applies to milk, okay? So let's see this one. Basically, the core structure of the sentence is very simple. That is, it applies, applies to milk. So applies to is a combination of transitive verb. So it applies to milk. That's it. So this is the structure <laughs> of the sentence. All else are modifiers. Okay, all else are modifiers. Okay. If they are odd modifiers, it means that they can be taken away. Okay, they can be taken away without harming the structure of the sentence. Let's go down to number 19. <coughs> Question six. Okay. D. Uh, okay. Uh, let me explain this to you. This is a subordinative conjunction. So this segment here is a uh, dependent clause. So what we need to have is the uh, independent clause over here, right? 
And did you see this one? When we use but, but is a coordinative conjunction. 对等连接词 It means that you have to connect independent clause and the independent clause, right? So you cannot have but here. See it? Okay. Thanks for your input. Okay. Uh, nineteen. Is that right? Nineteen. Okay, so so geographer were once concerned larger with exploring areas unknown to them, and uh, not from from means away. We are using the way of describing, so we have to change it to by scribing. Okay. So with exploring and by describing, okay. So this is the use of the prepositions. From, it means somewhere distant. We are not using it, but now we are using the methods by describing distinctive features of individual places, right? So you have to use by. Okay. So now let's move to eight number. Yeah. Function with and. Uh, Concerned with, yes. Ah, uh, you are right. Maybe not change. Basically, concerned with exploring areas unknown to them and. Uh, If we are using with as a preposition, then we can take this away. Skip it. I will use with. Thank you very much for this. Yeah, this is also right. That's true. Okay, so it would be better to just skip it. So I will keep that in mind. Thank you for your input. Okay, so now let's move to number eight. Okay, this one is rather long, right? So, but however, basically we have to identify the structure. Uh, first, we notice that there is a but here. But indicate a coordinative conjunction. So the segment here must be independent, and uh, the section here has to be independent too, right? So let's check the green part. Disagreement should not always be avoided. Oh, this is good because we see disagreement should disagreement should be avoided. It has complete a sentence, right? This this is an uh, independent clause with column. Column provides some additional information. So why it should be? Should not always be avoided because it can be healthy if handled creatively. So it can be healthy if it is handled creatively. So there's nothing wrong for here. So now let's look at this part. This part has to become an independent clause too, right? So they. There will always be disagreement. So this disagreement is the subject. Subject, and uh, will be is the be verb, and there is the adverb for place. So this is the independent clause. So basically, what we have here must be an independent clause. No two people think exactly alike. So how can you make a clause to become dependent? 
So basically, what we need here is to find out a subordinative conjunction or an adverb. So this one, which one is the choice? The only choice is because. Because no people think exactly alike, there will always be disagreement. So this is the complete structure, right? And the connected by but, but is the coordinated conjunction, and we have another independent clause here. Okay, so let's uh, move to 12. So let's identify the subject first. Future. Future and the verb is is, right? Is about, is about 90% team. So let's see this one. Which one? This one is a little bit tricky. If we knew, if we know that future is the subject, right? And is is the adverb. And we say that the subject complement for be verb can take in three different forms. Adjective, noun, or adverb for place or time. So now, I want you to identify. Can you do this? <coughs> this is another roll call, so you have to try. Subject complement for Q. Pewter is subject, is not subject complement. Equal to subject. Uh, you can have many different tries. If you answer this right, you get one point for your semester score. Two points. <laughs> I think I need to raise the stack, stake here. About three points for your academic score, or this one, three points. Okay, I'm going to end the roll now, and uh, 10 more seconds for you to have another try. <coughs> okay, so let's sh do this. Okay, and the rock. Okay. <coughs> now let's take a look. So we know pewter is the subject, right? And it is, is the B verb. And we also know when we try to add in a subject component for B verb, we have three different forms. That is uh, adjective, or a noun, or adverb for time or place. There are only ch three choices here. So adjective, noun, adverb, for time or place, right? So now we have is. So basically, what we need to have is to find the adjective or noun over here, right? But did you see the noun over here? Yeah, you see the thing here, right? But that is not the subject complement. Actually, the subject complement for this sentence is about 90% thing is an adjective. Why? Because preposition, prepositional phrase can take in the function of become an adjective or adverb, right? 
So basically, about 90% teen refers is of 90% is an adjective. So pewter is adjective. You can do that. So remember that this is a prepositional phrase and it is an adjective. It functions as an adjective. Okay, so now let's back, go back here first. I will take you some time, yeah? Okay. So look here, it's about 90% tin, right? And tin here with copper or bismuth added to hardness is used to modify tin, this kind of tin is a modifier. So basically this one is used to modify tin, that's it. No more, no less. So let, let's take a look at here. We can take this away, take this away, and you find out this is still a sentence. Pewter is about 90% tin. It's still a sentence. Is that right? So pewter is a subject, is, is the B verb. And about 90% tin is, is not separate with comma to about 90%. It's connected together. It is whole part. And then here there's a comma here. It indicate providing additional information for this kind of thing, this kind of thing. Okay, so this is not important. Just add in some additional information for you to enjoy, that's it. So basically, you can take that away, no problem. So now let's uh, provide you the answer. So pewter, so for eating and drinking utensils in colonial America. So basically what we need here is a uh, noun. So which one? can serve as this verb or that, or a, 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 I'm sorry, or an adjective. So basically this one widely used for eating and drinking is an adjective. So this can be used to modify pewter. Okay, so now uh, I will end here and uh, let's take a break and then please come back at 11, uh, I'm sorry, 12 after 10, so we still have 10 minutes for break. And by the way, if you want to uh, take back your answer sheet for Q, uh, question, quiz one, you can go to that classroom to ask for from a professor sheet. Just go there to take. So today, lesson three, we talk about different languages and different words. So look around yourself. So not only students from Taiwan, but also students from other countries, right? And uh, we have uh, students from Indonesia, a student from uh, Vietnam, a student from Holland, and uh, there should be many other students from uh, many, many, many different and strange corners of in the whole wide world, right? 40 years ago when I was in the United States, and um, my classmate did not know the location of Taiwan at all. They were always confused uh, between Taiwan and uh, confused with Taiwan with Thailand. So are you from Thailand? No, uh, Taiwan, Taiwan, oh come on, Taiwan. Taiwan is the only country I have at that time. So it was huge, big, and the only and great, right? But when I went to the United States, no one knew about Taiwan's location, my goodness. So I, I, I couldn't wonder, but just ask the students coming from abroad, when did you know Taiwan? I don't know, I have no idea. Maybe I could do a survey, right? When did you know, know Taiwan as the assistant? You, yes, when? Huh? Middle school. Okay, that, that's much better, I don't know. Even if I was in a master program, no one, most of my students, did not, uh, most of my classmates did not know Taiwan. Thailand, 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 no. I say Taiwan, indeed. 
I was from Taiwan, Taiwan indeed. <laughs> no, Thailand, mm -hmm. they are almost the same. But luckily, Taiwan is uh, a little bit well known uh, among the people in the whole world. But now let's talk about different language and different words. One thing for sure for us to know is we are not alone in the global village. We have to be very, very careful and very, very respectful when we contact with people from other countries because something for taken granted by us may not be regarded as, as normal as by another people, okay? So since we have some foreign students here, let me give you a test now. Look at my finger. How many is this? How many? How many? You know you have been in Taiwan for long, right? I know. If you are here long enough, you know this is six. But I tell you, my story of using this wrong six to represent my six. First time in 1987, and uh, I was in Indiana, Pennsylvania. So uh, there are six students all together from Taiwan. So we drove a very small car, packed together, go to the first visit to the McDonald near town, the town, <laughs> the town near our college. So we went there. I was dispatched. I was dispatched by my other classmates. Say, hey, Daniel, your English. It's good, so you go. <laughs> so I go. <laughs> so I look at all the different numbers of the combos, combo meal up there, right? And I look up there and I point out to this number one. And the lady asked me, How many you want? Actually, she deliberately sp speak in a slower way because she knew I was a foreigner. So, how many do you want? And I point on my finger, <laughs> satisfied, and wait. And eventually, she prepared two meals for me. I look at the two meals. I say, no, six. And the lady point out, straight her hands, and say, no, only two. One and two. See, cultural difference. So there will be a lot of misunderstanding just because of the, you do not know the cultural practice in another country. So when I, when I use my six to ask for six combo, but I only got two, the lady just feel confused. No, this is six. But she said, no, this is two. So strange, right? There are many other examples just like this. So let's move to our class for today. So look here. The outline for of the lecture, the first one, we will talk about cultural difference and adaptation. Yes, we are in a global village. Uh, we have seen so many people from so many different places, right? So how can adapt? And how can we cooperate? So how can we communicate so we can have a meaningful communication, and so we can live in harmoniously. And after the TED, the reading, we have English etymology and uh, sentence structures, and eventually, by the end of the class, we are going to talk about assignments for us. Okay, first one, perceptual differences of truth. So how do you define truth? People from different countries have different ideas. Let's uh, highlight some examples. Here for German, uh, for people from Finland, uh, truth is truth. Uh, we have a student from, uh, from Germany. Uh, his name is Henny, and he is now a master, master student in our program, in our department. Uh, he is very stubborn about truth. So there's no joke I can tell him, because everyone must be true. I say, OK, no joke. So uh, you could try to uh, talk to Henny uh, to see whether he is really insisting upon truth or not. But indeed, their regard about truth is very different from ours. So for German and for Finn, truth is truth. But uh, for how about for Japanese and the British? They have different idea because they believe that it will be all right if it doesn't rock the boat. 
If everyone can live on, then this is the, compro uh, the so-called compromised tooth, or a wearer's tooth, or a tooth that fits your needs. That would be good enough, fine with us, so long it does not rock the boat. But how about for Chinese? There's no absolute truth. So you can, if you have a good connection with the, with the governments, if you have a good connection, if you have a rich dad, then the truth can bend on you and it can fit your needs, right? So there's no absolute truth. Everyone is in the, and it, Italy, Italian has a many different, a very different version of uh, how, how they think about truth. They believe that truth can be negotiable. Yes, a truth under negotiation, so strange, right? So they have to figure out how you, how will you define the act here? How about the fact here? And uh, can we talk it out? So let's communicate, let's negotiate. So look here, look here. A very simple word, this, this is a concept, right? When we talk about truth, people from different countries have different perceptions about how they should regard truth. Not only truth, let's talk about, use another word, how about love? Among us, what do you think about love? I believe that people have different perception about love, right? And how about honest? How about a timekeeping? How about less hate? How about studying hard? Well, there are many, many different perceptions about this, right? Actually, people from different countries, especially, they do have different ideas about this very, very simple words. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. So basically, we can try to, it would be very difficult to understand, for us to understand the inner thinking of a person how they think about a certain issue. But we can observe, right? <coughs> we can observe their behaviors. So by observing their behaviors, we can understand what kind of um, cultural practice they have. So to some extent, we can have some idea about their cultures. So let's try to compare. Comparison of national cultures often begin by highlighting differences in social behavior. So let's see the different social behavior here and to see whether you practice this or not. Uh, some of the students, one or two students here came from Japan, right? So <coughs> do you like shake hands? I, I, I don't know, but it says here, right? Do not like shake hands, they will bow when greeting each other. So Japanese are normally regarded very polite because they always bow and smile. And do not bow their nose, uh, blow their nose in public. <laughs> they don't do this. That's too rude, right? So maybe we can have some Japanese here to stand up and say, hey, that is us. No, you don't want to because normally you don't want to show off. But it seems to be a very stereotype perception for other people to think, right? This is Japanese. How about Brazilians? Brazilians are different. They are on timing. They would form on lowly bus nights. They prefer brown shoes to black. Strange, right? Why brown shoes to black? But actually in Taiwan, <coughs> we do not, normally we do not wear white dress, uh, I'm sorry, black dress with white shoes. Why? Because a lot of gangsters will just do this. <laughs> you don't want to be marked as a gang, one of the a gangster, right? So you don't want to do this. But Brazilians, they prefer brown shoes to black. And arrive, this is the very outrageous, arrive two hours late at the cocktail parties. Why? I couldn't understand, you know, because in Taiwan we never do this. It would be extremely, extremely rude if you just come in the party and two hours late. And when you arrive, you will find that everyone is gone. So strange, right? 
but it's true. But they have different philosophy. Come on, it's parties. Parties is to enjoy, right? What's the hurry? Let's enjoy the let's enjoy the happiness of being easy. Well, it seems to be in this way, right? So this is Brazilian, and they they don't think that this kind of practice is bad at all. It's normal. It's life. And how about Greeks? Greeks will stay you in the eye. When we yeah in Taiwan we will do the same thing right when we communicate I will look at your eye to show my respect right, but the other one is very strange they will nod their heads when they mean no. Can you do that to me? Do you want to have two? Uh, do you want to have a uh, a hundred quizzes in the semester? I believe that the answer should be no right. So let's practice. Uh, how to say that? Uh, no 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 no. That would be very strange, right? But that is their practice. My goodness, and occasionally smash plates against the walls in restaurants. <laughs> When you feel the dish is so good, my goodness, let's enjoy and smash the plates. And we don't do this either. In Taiwan, we will politely, we will just politely clean up all the trash and dish and push it into the recycle bin. <laughs> we always do this. Because we believe that is a courteous way to do, different. And let's go look at、uh, French. <coughs> What about French do? And this is the plate, right? And when they eat, they will wipe the plate clean with a piece of bread. I I have seen that a lot, indeed. They will clean all the all all the different parts and throw pastry into their coffee. The the bread and the pastry into the coffee and the you this is dry dry pastry right and dip in the coffee get it a lot of、uh, some water and feel the kind of humid hmm tastes good. Well, this is very similar to Taiwanese practice in eating uh drinking dou jiang and the you tiao. Very similar. We will dump the you tiao into the dou jiang and eat it. That's true. But they 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 they. they Do this with pastry into coffee, and offer handshakes to strangers in bistros. Even I don't know you, but since we are in the same bar, hey buddies,、um, I don't know you, but still, let's shake hands. Shake hands. Different practices, right? And how about Brits, the English people? They will tip their soup bowls away from them and eat peas with their forks upside down. I saw this before, years ago in the Department of Inter International Affairs. We had a professor coming from England, Professor Ingster, and every time he ate, he used a spoon upside down and eats his beans, and twist the forks just like a scoop, and just take it out and eat. Ooh, dear brotherly, just how to say that. Bloodily delicious. <laughs> Every time he did that, so <laughs> interesting. And、uh, play golf in the rain. Right? It's quite understandable, right? Because、uh, London is always raining all the time. So look here. All of this, when I describe the different practice, different behavior, I believe that the first reaction from your side must be. Some kind of smiling and、uh, fascinating, and some kind of intriguing. Wow, so so strange and、uh, well, that's、uh, cool, right? Because they are different. They are different. Okay, so this kind of first impression about their behavior is some time for us to start compare their cultural differences. Okay, so this kind of Strange behaviors will certainly cause a lot of great amusement to us, right? Because we feel <laughs> what that's so funny. Let's look at here. We believe, for sure, these various manners and mannerisms cause us great amusement. Can we practice? Can we learn? Can we adapt to this practice? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Right. 
And uh, we would certainly smile at foreign eccentricity. Eccentricity is not, not normal, not normal behavior, something out of the ordinary. So eccentricity, oh, they are so strange. And uh, in the same time, we congratulate ourselves on our normality. So look at here, we are so normal, they are so abnormal, they are so strange, right? And yet, look here, and yet we are aware that these idiosyncrasies are largely superficial. Idiosyncrasies means unique characteristics. These unique characteristics are largely superficial because we know they do this, we, they, they do this just because of their cultural understanding, but they do this do not mean any harm to people, right? They just practice. They just practice. For example, the first time I went to US for my master's degree, I met a girl, no, I, I, I should not use the word met, I knew <laughs> a girl from China, from mainland China. You know, in 1987, it would be very difficult for their citizens to, uh, uh, to study overseas. So this young lady actually came from a very wealthy family. Well, that would be fine, right? One semester later, she went to England, to, went to London to become an exchange student. And after that semester, she came back. She came back uh, from England to the United States. And we m met, encountered another time. And at that time, she gave me a hug and say, how nice to see you, Daniel, and I give it a lot of hug, without kisses, of course, because I try to avoid. So strange. My goodness, are you a Chinese? I am from Taiwan, you're from China. We should be very similar in cultural practice, right? I never hug a lady in public, because that would be very strange. But she gave me a hug. Wow, you see? She really adapted to the practice there. So we do, we can practice, we can adapt. So look here, in France, if you went to France, I am quite sure about one thing. Sooner or later, have, you will be happy to dunk your croissant and make a mess. <laughs> you will put your croissant in coffee, right? And make a mess and eventually wipe out all the mess into your mouth. You will do that. You don't feel that is bad at all because you, you know, it's not you, but you can practice, okay? And in Brazil, how about Brazil? We know they, are, they love to be late, right? But what's wrong with being late? Because you will discover the delight of turning up outrageous late. The word you use here is very strange, the delight of turning out. Turning out is outrageously late. Delight, happiness, how can that be? But eventually, if you were in Brazil, you would know that. Actually, we do have a student from Brazil. And at her first year in the department, she was always late. And one day she came to me, Daniel, I have to change my habit. I said, what, what kind of habit? Uh, being late. I said, yeah, it's not good to be late all the time. But we do this in Brazil all the time. You know, in one semester, if I, if I go to the school three times a semester, then my teacher will say I'm a good student. Seriously? Seriously, yes. I say, unfortunately, come on, adapt to our cultural practice. It's indeed so strange, right? You never know that. If you attend school three times a semester, then your teacher will say you are a good student. Well, the delight of being late. Great, okay, but this is not practiced here. <laughs> but we can still learn to adapt, right? Okay, how about St. Petersburg? Go to Russia now again. 
We could throw vodka glasses over our shoulders with abandon. Abandon is here is not is not to give up. Abandon is a resolution with a determination. This is the glass vodka, right? And throw there without abandon, without any kind of hesitation at all. Just feeling fine. So why do we adapt ourselves to their cultural practice? Well, there is a very good reason for this. Because we join strangers, whoops. We join strangers in their social ways, partly to conform and partly for fun. Is that right? Partly to conform, partly to for fun. There are only two reasons. It's good to be one of them. Just like when I was in the United States, actually I went to church every Sunday. I'm a church goer, <laughs> actually. You know how long I have been in the United States? I have been in the United States for 11 years, my goodness. And I went to church every Sunday. So definitely I'm a, I was a church goer. But uh, do I believe in church, a uh, Christian, Christianity? Not quite, because I hate reading Bibles. Because the, the, the script written in the Bible is so, so out of my understanding, because I'm a rational person. I love to reason. I don't want to believe in myth or theology. So, but I did. I, I went to church every Sunday. So if you want to talk Jesus to me, that would be fine, because I love to talk. But I don't want to read Bible. So I never attend any kind of Bible reading class because I, I, don't, I don't want to pretend I really get involved in that. But I, I can become the friend of the Christians. So I'm, uh, I don't know, but I, I went there, just conform. Because if I did not go to the church, I would have no friends at all. <laughs> because in, in America, when you go home, then everyone is going home. No one just come out of the street and say, hey, Lao Zhang, Lao Li, ah, let's go to somewhere. No, we don't do this. If you want to go to another person's house, you have to make a call to arrange the, <laughs> the meeting first. You do not knock on the door and say, hey, can I drop in? No, you are not welcome at all. So different cultural practice, right? OK, so we have two reasons, to conform and to for fun. So, Actually, we can become French or Greek for an evening. That would be fine, right? We join the French party and become French in a way. That would be fine because it should be fun. And uh, can sit down tatami with Japanese colleagues. Ohayo, gozaimasu. Then we can say a little bit about Japanese, right? And I can introduce myself, what I see was and then that's, uh, I'm a Chinese or Taiwanese, and I have no idea. This is the only Japanese I can say. Konbanwa, konnichiwa. That's it. Yeah, I can practice. And I can eat legs of, <laughs> of lamb with one hand among others. So this is huge, huge lamb feet, right? The lamb leg, legs of the lamb I can eat. Wah, just like a very, very strong man, and eating with error. We can do that, no problem at all. But these practices are all superficial, just on the surfaces, just on the surface. Why? Because we know who we are. In the very bottom, inner part of our heart, we know I'm a Chinese, I'm a Taiwanese, I'm a Japanese, I am a French. We know we are. Right? So, but what's going on in our heads remains a private, well protected constant. Private only belongs to me. Well protected constant, it would be very difficult to change, right? For example, when I was in the United States, I, w I lived in New York. I live, I, once I lived in New York City, and I also lived in Washington, D.C., and no matter where I went, I still love to eat soybean sauce. But the problem is that the soybean sauce is very expensive up there. <laughs> very expensive. One bowl of doujiang, 
can cost me five USD dollars. Five dollars. My goodness, how much you need to spend to, to, to eat a bowl of doujiang soy, do, soy, soy sauce being, uh, uh, soy bean sauce here in Taiwan? Twenty? NT at most? Right? So you can imagine that the difference is there. The very inner part of your heart remain a private, well-protected constant. It is very difficult to change because you are you. We may put on a show for others because we try to conform. We try to have fun, right? But all the while we follow our own silent program. We still have what we have. We are here, right? Just like you, even though you come here from other countries, I know you are still you. The very inner part, you are still you. You will conform the practice here in Taiwan, and you will come and uh, go with your friends here just for fun, and you will adapt your uh, behaviors to, uh, to, to just like theirs. But the very inner part of you still well protected and private. That is still you, right? And we know this. You know this. Okay, so let's move on. Anyone has questions? So if not, so let's look here. Why, why do we adapt those kind, th that, those kind of the superficial behaviors on appearance? Well, because we are, it would be much easier to adopt this kind of superficial behavior without just prejudice. We know different countries, right? We know, uh, let's do it. Okay, so let's hear. We have cited a part of the superficial public behavior. And uh, if we really want to investigate its origin, we know it's all about culture. So this kind of behavior is cultural in origin. And yet, we can adopt these manners without prejudice to our own core belief. So see, basically, when we live in another country, we know we are we, but we will practice the behaviors of theirs, right? And there's no harm feeling at all. This kind of thoughts and the behaviors are not definitely are not contradictory to each other. Because we are we, we can still find, right? So our core belief, our core belief still remain there, right? So here basically we have uh, two sets of issues to talk about. One is actions, the other one is thoughts. We can act but our beliefs still remain the same, right? So let's take a look at the two different sides. Let's first take a look at actions. Actions, well, we try to mimic the actions, right? So basically, actions are easy to emulate. We can in imitate. We can just copy and practice. That would be much easier. Just like a lady friend I had <laughs> in the, my master program who came from, coming from China, right? When she gave me a hug, yeah, that's a, that's a very, very British style. I had no idea at all, right? And even different vari uh, variety of speech can be imitated to some extent. Uh, the so-called different variety of speech different intonation, different ways of speaking, right? You can imitate, there's no problem for this. For example, if you say, if you live in Harlem, uh, Harlem, Manhattan, you will say, hey man, no problem, then. let's go there. And if you li live in Texas, oh no, no problem, no, there's another noise over there. If you live in, uh, let's say in the in the uh, England, northeastern part of the America, then you will try to speak a very standard way of English, easily adopting superficial behaviors without prejudice. Well, it seems very noble, right? You can practice. <coughs> you can practice, you can imitate. They are easy. They are easy. But how about thought? 
you live in another country and you try to imitate their thoughts, that would be much difficult, right? So how difficult it is? Well, first, we have to admit the imitation of thoughts is a different matter because we cannot see it. We cannot hear it. And uh, it may be revealed to us with reluctance, simulation, or cunning. So, see, actually, even though I have lived in the U.S. for 11, more than 11 years, I still have no idea about how Americans think about me. Because every time, my friends, even sometimes they were inviting me to for a Thanksgiving party, Sometimes they were inviting me to go somewhere. I believe that they are all out of courtesy. I have no idea and how, to, how they really think about us. We, Daniel and his family. No idea at all. And uh, my boss in Washington, D.C., and she was young, and uh, she always talked to me, Daniel, 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 would you like to go there, to go there? And, uh, I really, it's very difficult to observe, to really understand what she was thinking about this kind of invitational actions. So it's difficult because we know people will become courteous, polite to you when they really want to communicate, especially they know you are a foreigner. They know you are a foreigner, right? So they will be courteous to you and they will try to just give you the best part of themselves, but not everything. So here comes the cross-cultural problems. We know when we try to have the so cro the so <coughs> conduct the so-called cross-cultural communication, indeed, we need to communicate, right? And when we talk about the communication or cross-cultural negotiation, we need to make sure the message from our part is faithfully and completely reaching to the other part, the other party. But that is very difficult, very difficult, right? <coughs> so this kind of cross-cultural problems ri arise will be a lot, right? Arise not so much on account of our unfamiliarity with the bow, a garlic truck, or chopsticks. We, you can use chopsticks, right? There's no problem for this. And when you ask French, do you know that? They will give you a disc. Hmm? What does this mean to you? Yes or no? Hmm? Because, because my brother-in-law is a French. I, every time I, I saw Pierre, I said, Pierre, how do you think about this one? Do you think that it's good? Hmm? Is that good or bad? Mm, you okay? Gallic struck. <laughs> so I have no idea. But every time, just do this. So strange. And or you look at the bow, you know it's a show of courtesy, right? We know that. We know that. But this is not the origin of the so-called cross-cultural problems. Cultural problems come out from, they can accumulate, come out to you, not because of certain compact, concepts, because of many of these compass, concepts are shared by other cultures. We know, we do share some of the very similar concepts. For example, how about honor? What do you think about the concept of being honest? Honor is very important, right? But there's no way for you to say, hey, the honor in China is much better than the honor in Italy or in Spain. So I'm going to teach you the word honor, how to keep your honor. So we can teach a Spaniard nothing about honor. We cannot. Because they, they have their own idea about honor, right? And uh, Japanese are master of courtesies. They have uh, many, many different ways to show their courtesies. And we don't have to teach them. And when they try to teach us, uh, it will become a very difficult issue too, right? Because you, you just don't feel like it. For example, bow every time. Strange, right? Because in Taiwan, we do not practice this. Even though, even though we know 
It's a courtesy, show up from the Japanese side, but in Taiwan, even though we know we do not practice. And the Swiss, Brits, and Germans are all convinced of their own honesty. So let's see, another one, we have uh, several concept words here, honor, courtesy, or honesty. These concepts are necessary, are not needed for you to teach them, it's because they know. Honor, duty, love, justice, gratitude, and revenge are basic tenets of the German, Chinese, Arab, and the Poly Poly Polynesian alike. Doesn't matter whether you live in North Pole or whether you live in uh, Europe or China or in the South, in, in Africa. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for that because you are, you know of this word. Although the connotation of this word may have some differences among different cultures. For example, justice. Well, how do you think about justice? People from different countries have different ideas. The framework is somewhat different, right? The framework is somewhat different. But the word the of concept for justice applies to all. They have their own version. You don't need to teach. You don't need to say, hey, your version of justice is wrong. There's no way for you to do it. A Tasmanian knows his or her duty as clear as a Greenlanders does. Tasmania is an offshore island uh, south uh, to Australia. And before 17th century, when the white, white discovered the land, Tasmanians were actually living isolated from the whole wide world. There's no communication no travel, only people living there. So they are, they have been isolated from the human development for ages. But after that, they still, even though they still know their own duty, they have to take care of their parents, their families, their kids, right? They have to fish, they have to farm, and they have to uh, raise everything to uh, make sure that braids and food are on the table on time. They know, they also know how to, they need to defend their countries, their homeland, when they are invaded or attacked by other tribes. That's their duty. Do we learn this duty from other culture? Of course not, of course not. The cultural setting we live in will orient ourselves to know the very meaning of duty, the very meaning of love, the very meaning of the so-called justice, right? And this approach of the so-called socialization is done possible by everything around you. Your family, your peers, your government, your school, and uh, your media. And we say they are the major components for you to become a socialized person. And remember, imagine this. Since everyone's setting is different, everyone's setting is different, so we are different. Very natural, right? Very natural. Okay, so question? If not, let's... Uh <coughs> so we talk about this different kind of concepts. So actually, in reality, we know for sure. Many common concepts are firmly rooted in various uh, societies. You do, not, you do not need to teach them, say, hey, my value of being honest is much higher than yours, so follow me. No, no, no. So this simple conclusion We couldn't help but just think about another, another thought. That is, let's look at the size of the world. We are living in a very huge world, right? Uh, more than six billion of people now living in the globe, in the world. And uh, that's a lot of people, right? So we are just a very tiny sand of this. The world is so huge. The history is so long, 
and uh, different varieties we have encountered, different communities, uh, tribes, countries, state, co and counties, and, uh, and so on, and uh, the so-called immeasurable variety. It is not possible to measure in measurable variety. So if we look at the size, the, his the size of the world, the long history, and we are so different in many, many aspects, right? If you look at this, then you will be amazed to agree this one. It is remarkable for how many common concepts are rooted so firmly in a similar manner in very different societies. So look at our superficial values, practices. <coughs> We're all from different countries, different society, right? And uh, even, even you are from Taiwan. If you live in Taipei, or a student from Taipei and a student from, let's say, a very countryside from Taitung, is certainly this certainly have no common grounds, right? They have different ideas about education. Let's talk about education. When I was in the state again, I was amazed to find out all the kids from Taiwan and China studied very hard. They just like mimic the way of education in Taiwan and move the setting to, so to the United States. And, and as a result, most of the kids from Taiwan were judged as genius. Because they are so good at math, good at everything. So they were judged as talented. So they went through a lot of tests and identified, so, oh, this is genius. So they need to go to a specialized school. Strange, but I tell you, no, not at all, not at all. Just a different practice. But I also seen in, a, in New York, when I was in New York City, I also seen some folks, some kids from Mexico. They have a different idea about education. Kids, the function of kids, primary focus on how to support the family, but not how to enrich themselves. So their kids were not encouraged to have a lot of education. If they could, they would go to the factory to become uh, producing elements for their family welfare. Different practice. The problem here is that which one is better? There's no way for us to judge. Just different, just different. But, but do Mexicans have the idea about duty? Do Taiwanese have the idea about duties? Of course. Of course. And the concept of duty are actually rooted in the very heart of those people from different parts of the society. So you will be amazed to find out the two different comparisons with this one. We are living in a, such a diverse, diverse world, but we have seen that so many common, common concepts are rooted so firmly in a similar manner in very different society. So we all know duties, even though the idea of, b of taking on the duty is somewhat different, right? And what we often overlook is the fact that everyone has different notion of these concepts that appear to so many cultures. So let's look here. Romantic love is seen differently in France and Finland. Finland emphasizes on truth, right? So romantic love is a lifelong engagement. But for France, it's a purely romantic love. One night stand will be found, right? Different. And how about the English notion of revenge? bears little similar similarity to the Sicilians. Sicilian. So you can see they are different. Sicilian we know, all know from the, at least from movie. We have a lot of Godfather movie series, right? So Sicilians, 
they use gun to negotiate with each other. So when they talk about revenge, they use gun. But how about how about English? English notion about revenge is uh, to fight, uh, win to win over the bistros, to win the status. So you see, they are all different. So basically, one thing for us to make sure is that we have to accept cultural diversity is there. Cover cultural diversity is there. The, the difference is vast. Let's take a 10 minutes break and back again. Okay, now in 10 seconds, I will end uh, the roll call for this time. Okay, end. So we, we do appreciate the difference uh, between cultural practice, and we also know the cultural diversity is so vast, it's so huge, right? So let's look at the reading here. So uh, we, re we really accept that cultural diversity is vast and formidable. It's so huge, and everyone just keep on practicing all the time. That means formidable, right? For example, E.g. refers to four example. The surmountable barriers against communication and a mutual comprehension between an Inuit hunter, Eskimo, and a Nigerian herdsman. So let's look here. This one live in North Pole, and there's no idea about ice, and there's no, they have no idea about sand because they have no chances to see sand at all. They have no idea about the so-called heat because it, everything is so cold over there. But if you look at the, an, another side, a Nigerian herdsman living in South in Africa, so all desert, they have to run in and uh, keeping their own life by hunting all the time, right? So you can see they are so different. They speak in different languages. They practice different kind of cultures. So uh, how can they communicate? How will they communicate? So let's think about the scenario. We have two very different people sitting in front of each other. Hey, say let's communicate. So let's see what kind of hurdles that we may encounter. First one, we ask. Given their different backgrounds, what would they talk about? Talk about weather? Oh, look at that. We have uh, so many different snows out there. Huh? Snow? If they speak English, of course. Snow? What, what is snow? <laughs> okay. They probably would be completely unaware of the structure or politics in each other's society. The politics, for example, Inuit will, will regard a polar bear with a nice hunt game, right? That's a nice game for them to hunt. That'd be great. But how about Nigerian herdsmen? Cattle? What is cattle? No cattle over there, right? So it is hardly likely that they could imagine the opposite extreme of climate. Very difficult for them to think. Their religions, taboos, values, aspirations, disappointments, and the lifestyle, all of this, would be in shock, in shock, in shock, oh, not shock, in shock contrast. They're all different, they are all different. And a variable subject of conversation, 
What can they talk about? There must be some issue for them to talk, right? And then, if they had some mode of communication at all, let's say if they speak in the same language, but maybe they can use their hands, sign language. But even so, sign language are different too. Sign language is different. For example, how you point out yourself. In Taiwan, most of the time we point to ourselves, we will point here. But do you know Americans will point here? That's different. That's different practice. So even the sign language are different, okay? So a variable subject of conversation would be minimal and approaching, approaching zero, almost none. They have nothing in common to talk about. Well, they can talk about food. What do you eat for lunch? Maybe, right? approaching zero. So people from two completely different cultural backgrounds in such an extreme case, it would be very difficult for them to communicate. So you see, this kind of cultural diversity is so huge, right? So we have to accept. We know they are there. Okay, so basically, why it is important for us to understand this? I believe that we can use this kind of cultural understanding to enrich our morals, to make us a better person. Indeed, we know, we appreciate, we will smile at the idiosyncrasies of other practice, and we do not feel offended because we know it's quite normal for them to do this way, right? So after you have this kind of different sort of cultural understanding, then you could work on this as one of your careers, maybe, right? You can go out. You can go abroad to enjoy life there, maybe. Okay? It's so strange. One of my college classmates, she, uh, she served in the military for 20 years. And after 20 years of service, she went to France and become and became a tour guide over there. That's so strange. She never learned the French in school at all. <laughs> but where did, she, where did she learn French? I have no idea. But after she went to France and became a tour guide, she could speak very, very fluent, fluent French. I still have no idea. Why is that? I believe that she adapted to their lifestyle, and she feel very, very fun about this. So let's look at this. The conclusion for the lesson, the wildly differing notion of time, space, life after death. Do you believe in God? Do you believe, if you are a Buddhist, if you are a Buddhist, you believe that your, your, your spirit, after you die, will go west, go west, or go to hell. If you are a Christian, you believe that your spirit will be saved by God, go to heaven or go to hell, right? But for Buddhists, there's another choice. Maybe you, can, you will have the recognition, which means that you will reverse. You will be reborn in another life. But it all depends on how good you behave yourself. If you do not behave well next life, your next life will become, a, let's say, a pig, a dog, or a cat, that is good, right? But if you behave, you will become another person in this life. So <laughs> Buddhists believe in this way. So this is the perception, cultural perception about life after death. Nature and reality held by isolated societies will have little impact on international business. Let's look here. We know Tasmanians, we know Inuit, they have a very different perception about this, right? And we learn, we try to understand. And what is the use of learning this? Actually, nothing, very little impact to, uh, if you want to become a, have a career in international business. Well, not too much for you to trade, right? 
Really, if you want to learn to trade, you have to learn, let's say, international econ economics. You have to know what is the so-called physical policy, what is the Keynesian school of economics, why is that the government intervention into the market is so important and uh, not too much. There are other issues, right? Okay, so this is, uh, this is the so-called useful knowledge for your career, but what kind of usefulness of, uh, for us to, uh, to understand the different time notions, space notions, life after death of those isolated societies? Why? Well, I've enriched, basically, enrichment. Enrichment is one thing. We just know the differences. We just know that they have, people out there, they have the different value systems. Uh, remember this, people out there have different value systems. Not all people are like us. We are not unique in any way because we are only part of the global village. So we have to learn to appreciate. And this kind of mindset this kind of philosophy is much, much important than the knowledge that can enrich you to do international business. Because the knowledge for doing international business is, is for your job, something for you to make a living. But how about the, this kind of appreciation about the cultural diversities is part of your philosophy. and make you a person of love you know, wow, we should love others, right? Uh, because we are different, but so interesting ourselves, right? Okay, so basically, the so-called morals of philosophy may be contributed by this kind of understanding. I, and I believe this is very important. It changed us, it changed us. The purpose of college e education is to make you become a better person. Not to become a more skilled person at all. Yes, but not completely. If you want to learn skills, go to professional schools. Go to training centers. You will learn how to do the uh, work carving, right? You will, you will know how to farm. Go there. But college education is about how to make you a better person. So the first of all, that's why the department has offered you one third of course in international cultural studies. We try to understand people are different and uh, along the way of uh, your four years of education, you are graduate, gradually nurture your appreciation for this kind of cultural diversities. Okay. So we can be reached by the striking insights, unique thoughts, and speech process um, among many cultures. We can be reached by this one. For example, let's take a look at the, the number holes with their nuclear concept of speech. Number hole is an uh, Indian tribe in uh, America. Have you ever seen the movie Wind Talker? Wayne Talker, let me type the word for you. <coughs> Wayne Talker. Uh, if you have not, if you want to understand number hole, then you can go there. It is the war movie acted by Nicolas Cage, and uh, it is um, very fascinating. Because number holes, they have their, their very unique language patterns. And their language, their language was used as a code communication in World War II. Because no one else know the, uh, the, uh, the meaning of their communication, and uh, even the Japanese. So that's why they are used as the code breaker. So that, that's very interesting, if you want to see. And how about Zulus? with their 39 colors of green. Green? 39 <laughs> colors of green. This is not, uh, but uh, let's look at the Inuit. Inuit have uh, 40 types of 42 types of snow. 
people living in Taiwan uh, really have the experiences of a touching snow, right? But I tell you, snows are different. Any difference about the snow idea? Can you tell the differences? Enlighten us. Yeah. There are many different kinds of snows. Some snow is that uh, the temperature and the humidity combined together will create a different kind of snows. I never knew that before. And when I was in the United States, I was surprised to see, wow, snow is so different in many ways. If that is extremely cold. Have you ever heard about the snowflakes? Really, just like a uh, paper, it's a, it's a little snow flower flakes, right? It's just flowing from the sky and dropping on your coat and accumulate just like a uh, cotton flying over there. This is one kind of snow. So romantic in a way, you know. It is extremely cold, and the snow just flying down upon you, just like that. A lot of flakes, snow flakes. It's just like uh, in cartoon. When you heard that jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle all the way, and that snow flake upon you, that is the snow. And sometimes the snow is full of mud. And uh, sometimes the snow is like, is a, like a salt dropping from the sky, hurt you. Snow. So snow are different. They are not just like like. So you see, 42 types of snow. It says that I did not see all at all. <laughs> it's so strange. And aborigines with their dream time. What do you mean by dream time? I, kn we, I know we have nap, right? So I need to go to nap, take a nap. But that is their dream time. And the, the labs with their eight seasons, okay, the Finland, the, the aborigines are north to the Finland has eight seasons. But how about Chinese? We have 24 seasons. If you want to go to the Chinese rural Canada, we have 24. So we, we are much better in this way. <laughs> 24 compared with eight seasons, right? So you look at here. If you know we are living in a world with such a huge diver cultural diversity, then we will know that it would be good for us to appreciate, right? To accept the differences and then enjoy the differences. That's why we make the world so fascinating. So we can observe, learn about, and sometimes understand some of this group's world views. But deceived we are not. We are not deceived at all. We can practice their actions, but we are still us. We are still we, right? So we know more or less where we stand with these people. And uh, they live in their words and we live in ours. It's true. Cultural rooting, the root of your cultural practice, very, very formative. But fortunately for us, we are human beings, right? So what is the usefulness for us to learn this lesson? I believe that appreciation for cultural difference is the key phrase we should know. Appreciation for cultural differences. So that's why the department offer you so many courses in cultural studies. It's also part of the international affairs, right? So look here, you are so lucky. You are so lucky here. Not so many, for Taiwanese students, not so many Taiwanese students have the chances to study with, uh, to, to study in the same class as known with the foreign students, so many of them. And uh, for foreign students, you are so lucky too, because you move yourself to a strange new world to experience no, never ever gone before. That's like a Star Trek, right? But however, you will enjoy your life here. 
The first time I was in the United States, that night I still remember. Uh, August 17th, 1987. I went there and uh, transported to Indiana, Pennsylvania. I sat in front of the porch and looked at the sky. My goodness, it's already nine o'clock in the evening, but the sun is still there. <laughs> My goodness, nine o'clock, the sun is still there. That's a strange new experience, right? So go enjoy yourself. People are different, the world's so huge. And you have the chances to invite all the people now in the same classroom. Come on, exchange and communicate, interact, and enjoy the life of study here, okay? So let's enrich our morals through our cultural understanding. You will find. Okay, so any question? If not, let's move to the etymology part. So they probably would be completely unaware of the structure of politics of each other's society. It is hardly likely that they could imagine the opposite extremity of climate. So the four words here are actually a combination of different roots. First, politics. Politics, pol poly means city. Poly refers to city. So let's see this one. There are many words that we can use poly. For example, police. The first word is police. Police is actually originated from French. Because in Paris, this is the group of people working for the city. So police is the word you have to know. And uh, how about politician? Politician is the person work for the city. In the countryside before, they don't need a politician. So politician, if they want to make a living, they have to go into the city. So the city workers is the politicians. And let's look at the ICS. I see. Pertaining to the characteristic of it's an adjective. It's an adjective suffix. So I see is an adjective, and I see as refers to the subject relating to the characteristics of the city. So it is politics. Okay? And then how about economics? Did you see? They are very similar, right? ICS. ICS is the subject of knowledge related to economy. Then let's say, what about eco? Eco. Eco has a meaning. The meaning for eco is home. Home. And a known. Still remember Onin and the Naman? These two? What do these two mean to you? I nominate. Anonymous refers to these Latin roots, right? So Onin and Naman or Nang refers to name. Name. So what is economics? Economics refers to the subject knowledge refer related to naming the home. So when you have a home, you have to buy food, right? Arrange everything inside your home. So this is the buy, supply, demand, and the manufacture, and so on. So economics is the subject study about how to manage your home, economy, economics. Okay, so now politics 
is the study about city. <laughs> so that is a political science of politics, or the situation or the scenarios about cities. And we know poorly is city, right? So how about metro -ton? Did you see the word here? Poly, right? City, right? Metropolitan refers to big city. Big city, metropolitan. The big city area, metropolitan. Okay, so the next one is opposite. Come out from post. Post means to praise, to praise something. Praise something. So OB refers to toward, against, across, or down, on the other side, OB. So if you put something on the other side, then you oppose, right? If you oppose something, which means you put something on the other side, you are not together. So you oppose, okay? And opposite refers, I-T-E is an adjective, on the other side. So opposite, I'm not agreeable with you, okay? So look here, we have a position. Position is a place, right? The place we have means position. And if we pose ourselves, we place ourselves, pose, okay, oppose. And the other one is stream. Extreme, extremity come out from trim. Trim refers to trample, shivery, scaring. Okay, so extremity means that trim here, right? Ex means out. If you are shivering, then shivering out, the status of out of your shivering to the other side, that is very extreme, right? Very extreme, 非常极端的 extremity. And uh, climate. Climate is very funny because it come out from crime. Clean or clean means slope or region. Slope or region. For example, if you decline, what do you mean decline? Means that you refuse, right? D means away or off. So you recline means that you, this is the slope. Means slow, xiepo, slope, right? So you decline means that you slope away. Oh, I don't want it, go away, right? How about incline? If you have, if you incline means that you slope into, slope in, so you get close to something, incline. So if you have some qing xiang, inclination, is that right? Because you, the slope will lead you to the target, incline. And the climate, why we use climate to refer the change of the weather? Because if you see, this is a mountain, right? So along the slope, the temperature, the weather will change. So this is climate. So it will be much better to learn etymology, right? So we do offer you a lot of the etymology knowledge on the textbook. So you have to study by yourself. And it's very important for you to enrich not only your moral form from cultural understanding, but also your English word vocabulary. The ability of a large quantity of word vocabulary is very important. Imagine this. If you do not know too many words or do not know enough words for you to read, then every time you open a book to read some English passage, you have to check out the words. Would that be very boring? Is that right? But now, instead of checking up the dictionary, you can learn the Latin roots. And whenever you see a new word, you can use your knowledge of the combination 
etymology, then you will know the meaning. You can continue your reading without any hesitation. That will be much better. Okay? So do this, etymology. Okay, so let's move to sentence structure. So comparison of natural, national, national cultures often begin by highlighting differences in social behavior. Now, let, let's think about this one. Which one is the subject for this? The subject for this one? Of course, is comparison, right? Look here. This is the subject. Comparison. Whoops. <coughs> so comparison. What kind of comparison? Of national cultures. So basically this is used to modify comparison. So we do not need this section. Now, what is the verb? Begin, right? Begin and then what is, is there any object here? Not really, because begin is an intransitive verb. In <coughs> intransitive verb, there are two kinds of action verb. One is intransitive verb. The other one is transitive verb. Okay. This one we call 不及物动词. This one is 及物动词. Okay. So why? When we use a transitive verb, we need to follow it with an object. But this one you don't need. You don't need. Why? Because one way to look at this reason is that we can try to understand the combination of the roots here. First one, trains. Trains means across. <coughs> ITI means to go. I-V-E can be an adjective or noun. Here is an adjective. Now the difference is I-N. I-N can be in or not. Not. So let's take a look about intransitive. First, transitive refers to this is something you have to go across to the object. Okay? And the intransitive is, this is something you do not need to go across to a subject and sub object. So that is intransitive, not going across. Going across. Going, right? Across to an object. So it's Go across, so it needs to be a noun. go across, so there is no object. Okay. So this is another way for you to know why you have to need to have the English root. But let's come back here. <coughs> so basically, comparison of national cultures often begin. So subject subject and the verb, intransitive verb, the end. The structure of the sentence just include the two words, comparison and the beginning. Okay, so now we can use the sentence diagram to give the full structure. That would be much easier for you to understand why it is in this way. Look here. Although, the technique of drawing this, you will learn the techniques of drawing sentence diagrams in a workshop, and you will learn how to do this. It's okay, but for now, it's only important for you to recognize this is the so-called main nine, Upon the main nine, we 
include the major components of the sentence. That is comparison and the begin, right? And the vertical line, Cui Zi Xian, is used to divide subject and the verb. That's it. So look here, basically we have two very important parts, comparison and the begin, right? But we do have a lot of modifiers. Let's take a look. The first modifier is of national culture, right? Of national cultures, you see, of is a preposition, of cultures, and cultures is modified by national. But basically, this all together become a prepositional phrase. Is that right? Prepositional phrase can have only two functions. One function as a adjective. The other one is a function as an adverb. So look here. This is noun. This is a noun, right? And uh, something used to modify noun is an adjective. So basically, this modifier functions as a adjective. Is that right? Okay. And of is a preposition. Now, let's talk about this. Of is a pre position. Is that right? Preposition comes out from the different roots. That is, first one, pause. What is pause? To praise, right? So pause is to praise. To praise. And how about pre? Pre refers to before. Is that right? Before. It's very important for you to know this. And uh, go to, right? And ION is a status. So preposition, this prepositions is a status of a go, place, go before the object. So basically, Preposition cannot stand alone in one sentence. Remember, 介系词不可以单独存在在一个句子里. It must be combined with the object to perform, to, pre, to, to, uh, to, to present a prepositional phrase. So because preposition says so. This word must be put in front of the object. This is the idea for preposition, right? So, prepositional phrase. And then, let's think about the translation for prepositional phrase. In Chinese, prepositional phrase is called as 介系词片语, right? So why, why do we say that it's a 介系词? Why? 介系的片语. I'm sorry for this. Because it is between adjective and adverb. There are only two kinds of speech you can choose of. So prepositional phrase can only function either as an adjective or an adverb. This is the so-called 介系之片语, 介于两种之间. How about an infinite phrase, 不定词片语? Start with two and none, right? What is this? 不定词片语, we say indefinite. That refers to, it can be either a noun, a verb, an adjective, or adverb. So there are four possibility, indefinite, right? But four prepositional phrase is much easier because there are only two in between, adjective or adverb. Okay, so for now. So let's look here. This is the subject and this is the verb, right? 
and the subject is a noun. So we use the adjective, the prepositional phrase of national cultures to modify comparison. So something that you use to modify a, a noun must be an adjective. And let's look at the begin. Begin is a verb. Too much. Begin is a verb, right? So anything you can use to modify a verb is an adverb. Adverb. To verb, right? To verb, adjective, adverb. So look here, often is. And by, here is a trick here. By is a prepositional phrase, right? But a highlighting is a gerund and with the differences. So it's a verb, object, combined together, become a noun. So by noun, is that right? And uh, this noun differences is modified in behavior. What kind of behavior? Social behavior. So basically, this is an adjective. This is an adverb preposition, uh, adverbial phrase, if you want to say that. Functions as an adverb. So altogether, this is used to modify begin, modify begin, right? And remember, when we say the modifiers for a sentence can be taken away. So let's see the visual. Can we just scrap this of cultural national comparison away? No harm feeling at all, right? Can we take this away? Yeah, often, adverb, modifier. Can we take this away? Yes, modifier, right? So basically, the most important components is comparison and the beginning. That's it. So this is a very long sentence, but only this is important. So if you really, if you understand the structure, then it will be very easy for you to extend the length of the sentence. Let me try this for you. Comparison of national cultures that originated from China, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, United States, the Filipinos, Africa, and so on, often begin by highlighting differences in social sort of behavior. Is that right? Although I speak, a, I talk a lot, but they are all modifiers, all modifiers. So let's learn this. The nuclear part of the sentence is the most important one. And what is the nuclear part of the sentence? In this one, there are only two, comparison and the begin. That's it. Not all words in one sentence are equally important. No, not at all. You have to learn this. There are only two important words in this sentence, comparison, begin. Okay, so here comes the end of the sentence structure and assignments. First one, I want you to think about the proper attitude toward cultural diversity. I, I use the quotation here because it's not quite right to ask uh, such questions because there's Every, every kind of attitude should be fine. Appreciation should be fine, right? So proper attitude. You talk with your team members and uh, discuss first and write your own essay later. Remember, write your own essays, but not copy and paste. Don't do this. The other one is about brainstorming. So brainstorming, I, I provide you a link for you to learn something about brainstorming. So basically, I want you to identify at least 10 different cultural practices between you and people from other countries. Uh, you could have a free talk, small talk among your members. Hey, you can say, okay, in, in, in Taiwan we do this. How about you? Okay. So try to identify 10 differences. And for this one, I, I, will, I will agree to you, you could have a group report for this one. 
because you say you come out together and write up together. That will be fine. So this one is a group project that will be fine for you to submit your paper to write your own, own writing, uh, a group writing, and uh, you can do take this as a framework of your writing onto your own textbook. Okay, you can do this. And I encourage you to uh, talk with you because most of the groups in our uh, uh, team, team group in our class uh, always consist of some Taiwanese and some foreigners. So that would be very interesting for you to do so. Okay. And uh, number three, I want you to write a 300 word essay, the image of uh, the image of a typical Taiwanese in your mind. If you want to change the Taiwanese to some others, that will be fine too. For example, the typical Russian in your mind, if you happen to know some Russians out there, that will be fine. If you want, want to write something that like typical Japanese in your mind, it happen you have a Japanese friend, fine. But write a 300 word essay and uh, write on your paper. Okay? So that's about the end of the story. But before that, I will ask you to really work with your team to figure out how to answer the three assigned questions. And also synthesize your comments. Uh, I will not provide you the Google Docs, so you have to uh, write on your own textbook. Okay, write on them. Writing is very important. When you write, you can ingrain the writing process into your learning experience. So you have to write. And you have to answer the TOEFL questions too and date the score of correctness accordingly. I hope that you can uh, gradually improve your score under that. And of course, I do not ask you to, uh, uh, to, uh, to report the scores to me. Rather, instead, I ask you to keep the process to yourself. And I want you to, to verify, to test one thing. That is, if I study hard, can I really improve my English proficiency after 18 weeks of learning? Very good question for you, right? How about test yourself? If I really study hard in this semester, can I significantly improve my English proficiency? Maybe yes, right? And this 10 TOEFL test packs is for you to test yourself. That may be good, may be good. Okay, so next time we talk about, we have uh, two groups for taking the Pearson test, right? The test is arranged on October 12th. I will give further detailed info instruction to you on the two individual tests. Okay, so uh, October 12th will be next Wednesday. And I will give you more information on this, so let's have fun. Okay, any more question? Okay, thank you, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Don't, don't you say thank you back to me. Professor? Yeah, thank you, thank you.